Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and Midnight Mass is a Midnight Masterpiece. The show is a 10 out of 10 for me, and I feel like starting a fan club for Mike Flanagan as he's completely knocked it out of the park with his brand new horror show. There's so much to sink your teeth into, and throughout this video we're going to be breaking down the plot, ending, the easter eggs, and all of the double meanings within it. Full spoilers ahead, so if you haven't seen it, then I suggest you get out of this video in the neck of time. If you enjoy it then please smash the thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe so there isn't any bad blood between us. With that out of the way, thank you for clicking this, now let's get into Midnight Mass. Okay so Mike Flanagan has done a lot of projects I've absolutely loved. Oculus, Doctor Sleep and Haunting of Hell House are all classics in my eyes, with the latter being one of my favourite TV shows of all time. When The Haunting of Bly Manor was announced, I was extremely excited for it, but unfortunately I was very disappointed and found it to be a show that was a retread of the aforementioned series without any of the ingenuity that made it really stand out. However, Midnight Mass is incredible and it quickly put me at ease and reminded me why I love this guy so much. This week it was revealed that Flanagan has been planning the entire series for over 10 years and nods towards it have appeared as easter eggs in his previous projects. Midnight Mass is the name of a book in both Gerald's game and also Hush. The blurb on it even reads, for the 512 souls on Sleepy Crockett and Church put Riley face to face with a terrifying secret. The eyes of the undead also turn very similar to the eyes of the true knot and it's clear for Flanagan that there's a lot at stake here. Now in the first part of the video I am going to be breaking down the plot of the series just to add some context but if you want to skip ahead to the ending then time codes will be linked below. Anyway we open on the symbol of the ichthus which was created after Christ multiplied fish and loaves of bread in order to feed 5000 people. This idea of a symbol tied to Christianity is quickly juxtaposed by the horrific crash that starts the season and it subtly sets up the idea that we will be facing several themes such as religion which will be interlaced with death. In real life we've seen the horrors of what religion can lead to in the likes of things like Jonestown which similar to the season ended up with those indoctrinated sipping the Kool-Aid after they were told to end their lives by an authority figure. It all begins with Riley, a man who caused the aforementioned crash thanks to his drinking which led to the death of a young lady named Tara Beth. After serving four years in prison, he returns home to Crockett Island, a backwards fishing community struggling to stay relevant in an ever-changing world. Riley attempted to escape his life destined to be a fisherman by entering the world of tech, but alas, he would end up back from whence he came. He's an atheist, having read every single religious text from every religion, and he very much sees life as a waste of time that sucks worse than a vampire. This is what makes the show so layered, and no, that's not a garlic pun, but it might, it, well it is, yeah it is. Now usually, religious horror is explored simply through the eyes of Christianity, but in Midnight Mass, many different viewpoints are shown through Riley's atheism. There's a lot of examples such as a sheriff's unwavering belief in honour of his wife in Islam and Bev a Dolores Umbridge-esque do-gooder who carries a hatred of anything that isn't Christian. Riley is clearly racked with guilt and over the course of the series he must come to terms with what he did, his own mortality and how his family and neighbours view him. He tries to adjust to life on the island but Tara Beth watches over him, never letting him forget. At night he dreams that he's out on a boat in the middle of the ocean and we'll talk about how the idea of life being but a dream is paid off in this imagery later. Now life on the island mainly focuses around the St. Patrick's church and the core faith of each character is explored in great detail. Jump scares are swapped for lengthy monologues and discussions which are delivered expertly. Faith is the key as the show rumbles on and we meet each character such as Sheriff Hassan, an NYPD veteran pushed out of the force due to racism. There's also Aaron who wants to embrace religion, as well as a mysterious new priest called Father Paul who arrives after telling us that the last one fell gravely ill. Now as soon as I saw the large chest and the cats being eaten, I said that it would be f***ing vampires. Those who've read Bram Stoker's Dracula will know that the vampire arrived on the coast of Whitby in a chest just like this and if you've visited the fishing village you'll know it's a similar sort of setup to what we see in the show. The cathedral there looms over the entire area, much like the church in this, and though Flanagan isn't beating us over the head with the references, it's clear he's giving nods to the most famous vampire story of all time. Paul is later revealed to be Pruitt, who travelled on a religious pilgrimage, but due to his dementia he got lost and came across a vampire. Believing it was an angel, he cried out for help, and the beast fed on his blood which restored him and then healed him. It's important to know that communion is very much seen as drinking the blood of Christ and it nicely ties together to show how that can be subverted. 
Vampires, of course, need familiars in order to travel out into the world, and Pruitt very much becomes the Angels. Now, upon his return to the island, it's hinted that we are facing the end of days as a gigantic storm rolls in. The rain washes up the bodies of cats across the beach, which is reminiscent of the infamous plagues, and Riley is adamant that he's seen Pruitt, which is brushed away as being shadows in the dark. Paul, or should I call him Pruitt, starts mass, explaining how the island will rise again, and over time he becomes a popular figure on it. Many are down on their luck, including Lisa, who was paralyzed by the town drunk Joe, who, like Riley and Hassan, is seen as an outsider. Though it's never confirmed, Bev ends up poisoning Joe's dog, and it seems like she kills Paul too, which resurrects him. We never get this confirmed for Daphne, but he seems to die much like the dog does, with blood coming out of his mouth, and of course, let me know below if you disagree. Now in the series we learn that if one dies whilst Angel's blood is within their system, then they'll rise up as a vampire that wants to feast on human flesh. There are a lot of people confused over why Paul could handle the light early on, but at this point he wasn't technically a vampire, he just had vampire's blood in his system. Now Bev mentioned that the Bible speaks of angels with burning skin in Revelations, and both she and Paul use this to justify their actions throughout the show. When revealed to Sarah what has happened, she summarizes that the myths of the angels could come from a blood disease that creates a drastic need for iron. The sacrament asks worshippers to take wine said to be the blood of Christ, and he himself died and came back three days later. Sarah quite rightly explains this is indeed where Christian ritual could come from, and sharing his blood would mean empowering and curing people, explaining the miracles that are talked about in the Bible. We learn that Pruitt has a plan for improving their life by continuing to use the tainted angel blood for the sacramental wine, regenerating the cells of those that came to the church. He intends to make everyone's life better, and the healing properties of it allow Lisa to walk again. This miracle brings more people to the church, and thus it gives Paul a bigger flock to infect. Hints start to show that something peculiar is going on, as people start visibly healing. Riley's dad's back mends itself, his wife no longer needs glasses, and Sarah's mother basically does a Benjamin Button. Now it seems like Flanagan has replaced hidden ghosts for hidden heels, and though it initially seems like good news, it also has adverse effects in that it kills Aaron's baby. Atheism and faith in an era of miracles is explored in great detail, with Hassan struggling to get his child to follow Islam, as Ali wants to fit in and choose his faith, making this a multi-layered exploration of what it is to believe. Bev is vile towards the religion, and only becomes more and more emboldened as her idolization of Paul increases, someone she was dismissive of at first. After his death, Paul starts jonesing hard, and he kills Joe before drinking his blood. This happens after he points out the similarities between Paul and a young Pruitt, and he also pays lip service to the affair that the latter was apparently having with Sarah's mother. Another hint towards an eventual reveal comes when she said she thought she saw Sarah's dad's face at her bedroom window, but this is brushed away as being a side effect of her dementia. Later on, it's revealed that Paul is indeed Sarah's father, and we learn that he was peering into houses, which is set up nicely in that moment. Bev involves other town members, namely Sturge and Lisa's father in covering up his death, and slowly everyone begins to get their hands dirty in order to keep up the sanctity of the church. One night, Riley, on a chance encounter, turns up at the rec center, and Mr. Rex, so, so, sorry, the angel, kills him and turns him into a creature of the night. Now, if there's one core message I took away from this show, it's that not everyone is as virtuous as they claim to be. Paul explains to Riley what happened and urges him to follow in his footsteps by telling him a story about an altar boy who brought him a dying rat, which turns out to be Riley. Pruitt lied to instill Riley's faith, leading to Riley having an unrealistic expectation growing up that he now has stepped away from. There's also an incredible scene with both Riley and Aaron in which they talk about what they imagine death to be. Because of his distrust of the church, the former very much sees nothing at the end, whereas Aaron, who is grieving her baby, imagines them being embraced by her family in the afterlife. When Aaron dies in the show, she changes this thinking and instead views herself as simply a manifestation of the universe, dreaming of itself and what life would be like. Einstein famously said that energy can neither be created or destroyed, and Aaron very much surmises that we are here and then we go back to the greater whole. Our consciousness came from seemingly nowhere, but we all have our own thoughts and feelings, and when we cease to exist, we will return to whatever we were before. It's a beautiful conversation, and it somewhat foreshadows Riley's death, which comes not long after. 
Now Paul explains he wants to heal a community, but really he's just a self-serving person who's accepted these awful things citing scripture is a good reason. Paul intends for people to convert to being an angel, and though he says they'll be welcomed peacefully into this new life, they will all be very much forced to follow what he says. With Aaron, Riley heads out into the ocean and explains that this is very reminiscent of his dream. He finally finds his purpose, and Riley to me is someone who had two options. He could have lived for eternity as a self-serving vampire that would feed upon others to get his wish, or he could finally break free of this and avoid hurting the ones that he loved. Alcoholism and drunk driving are often seen as very self-centered acts, and the character doing this in the intro led to the death of an innocent woman. However, it also hurt his family, and on top of it, because of this, he's lived a life of misery. Riley could easily feast upon Aaron at this point, but instead he lets himself burn in the sun and he gives her the knowledge that she needs to take down Pruitt and his followers. This to me is why he's joined by the spirit of Tara Beth at the end, who has clearly forgiven him because he's learned from his mistakes. Rather than being alone on the boat as he was, his greatest mistake forgiving him means he can forgive himself as he passes away. It's a very beautiful mo- oh my god, oh, this is horrible, horrible. Now Aaron returns back to the island as the nighttime mass is being prepared for the Easter Vigil. This is one of the most popular times for church attendance and thus Pruitt can recruit more people to the cause. However, Easter itself is also about the death and rebirth of Christ, which is a theme that's used through the ceremony. Aaron plans to work with Sarah and her mother to stop the converted, however they ultimately fail as they fall in line and head to the church. At the church, the attendees are offered up a cup filled with Bev's poison and most of them willingly end their lives in order to be reborn. However, they're hungry for flesh and the undead turn on the living which leads to a bloodbath. Bev heads out into the night with the newly converted and they cast judgement on all, killing all of the islanders. We see some of the best sequences in the show as the rabid angels go around feeding and burning everything to the ground, believing that revelations is upon them. We witness Bev's twisted view that God is preparing his believers for the end of days and that the conversion will help them in the perpetual night. Her truly awful nature is exposed as she turns on Pruitt and won't even feed on Hassan, believing his blood to be tainted. The converted have their hubris ruined for themselves by burning most of the places they could have hidden during the day, and we see Eren, Sarah and Hassan navigate to the only hiding spots left to bring them down in a blaze of glory. It shows they are truly sinful, and just like Lucifer, their gift has been taken away, damning them to burn alive come dawn. Pride and hubris are some of the traits that God hates the most according to the Bible, so he does truly give and take away. In the end for all his sins, Pruitt does see the error of his ways, and finally he speaks to his daughter without the burden of hiding the truth. He realised that he had lost his way, and just before this, the fundamental difference between Bev and Pruitt was exposed. She saw the church as being an ark and a base to spread the conversion, but he explains that it was about God and doing right by his community. Bev has taken it to the extreme and she accuses him of switching to human things and not the divine. In reality, the hole he felt in his life has been filled by his daughter as he can now acknowledge his secret sin. He can finally leave the church which he wanted to do all these years and end life on his own terms with his family around him. Now one question you might have is did the angel die? As Erin lays there and life slowly starts to drain out of her, she cuts his wings as he feasts on her neck. Warren explains that the angel would need to fly around 30 miles to beat the sun, which would be very difficult for it. He's unsure if the angel can make the distance, but in the end, we just don't know. This creature has of course survived for centuries, and I don't think you can count it out either way. Now it's very much Schrodinger's angel, but I do think that thematically we can say that it's gone, as its life was very closely tied to the islanders in the show. However, there's always the possibility there that if Flanagan wants to do a sequel, that he can, and he should. He should, because this, this was amazing. No, he probably won't know because it was too good. Don't, don't ruin it by doing a sequel, Flanagan. I'll change me mind. Now in the end, we do have two survivors in Warren and Lisa. After gaining Chekhov's sniper rifle, they managed to flee the island on a boat in order to wait it out until dawn. Both were virtuous with Warren abstaining from drink and Lisa showing forgiveness to Joe. Sadly, it seems like Lisa will no longer be able to walk, which is of course due to the angel blood running out of her system. Now, it may seem like it's back to square one, but she has rejected the false prophets, something that the Bible has countless verses on. Lisa and Warren's escape could be looked at as the rapture, 
escaping the damned crocodile and much like the Christians say how the believers will be saved and the rest will be left to judgement. The others had twisted their religion to justify awful things and subverted the gift they were given, showing that humans had not really changed much from the original sin. The survivors of Crockett saw peace in the sunrise and looked to wash themselves away in the divine light of God. The Bible itself said in Luke, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunshine shall visit us from the high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. The sunrise is symbolic of a new day and the sins of the past being washed away. We also see the ash of their bodies blow over the boat and this is very symbolic of the saying ashes to ashes and dust to dust which of course pulls from the bible. As they die everyone on the island sings nearer my god to me and this has significance for a number of reasons. Firstly it contains lyrics about angels beckoning those on earth into heaven and how they will finally meet god. However it was also the last song to be played on the titanic as it and its passengers sunk into the ocean. Though it should be seen as a tragic ending for Lisa, she has very much avoided the easy road and though she is back to being paralysed she is still alive, unlike all the others who gave in to sin and the temptation of a better life. Her defeating this temptation and breaking away from the flock is what saves her in the end and it stands firm as a positive message. The series shows us that the road to hell is paved with good intentions and though she could have given in at any point due to pressure from her parents, an authority figure and her community, she didn't and now she gets to live. In the end it has a very powerful meaning and overall the show was a stunning work of acting, writing and the portrayal of a wide range of beliefs. This was merged into a layered and nuanced view on the spectrum of belief and religion that's a real page turner. I know the phrase page turner doesn't really work here but you know what I mean yeah it was you couldn't stop watching it. Seven hours no no breaks for me. Now it's something that each viewer will take their own meaning from just like the good book. Whilst Midnight Mass is a wild departure from the Haunting series and though some may take time to adjust to it, it's an absolutely outstanding series that I can't praise highly enough. It's rare that we give shows a 10 out of 10 but I think this deserves it as it's just phenomenal on every level. It's probably my favourite Netflix series of all time and I can't wait to talk about all the different themes with you in the comments below. Make sure you drop them and as a thank you we are running a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of Zack Snyder's DC Trilogy on the 30th of September. All you have to do to get it is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the show. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now so if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our breakdown of Squid Game which will be linked on screen right now. That's another amazing Netflix series you should check out so hopefully I'll see you over there right after this. If not then thank you for sitting through this video, I've been Paul, you take care of yourself and I'll see you next time. Peace.